I am uh, pleased to um, welcome our, our, our keynote speaker, um, a very um, a accomplished and legendary um, technologist of our times, Diane Green. Diane currently serves on the board of Google, Intuit, MIT, and Peninsula Open Space Trust. For those who may not know, Peninsula Open Space Trust is an organization that focuses on preservation of uh, land resources and habitat for current and all future generations. Diane spends significant time working with entrepreneurs and helping them build companies. She also serves as a judge on the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, uh, a global prize that recognizes uh, engineering advances um, and, and celebrates uh, engineering effort that changes our world. Diane co-founded VMware and was the CEO from 1998 to 2008, at which point she took the company public from, start, from a startup stage to growing it to a 7,000 employee worldwide organization. Before VMware, she was the founding CEO of VXtreme that was sold to Microsoft in 1997 and was, is the basis of uh, the Microsoft Media Player. Prior to that, Diane held management and senior engineering positions at SGI, Tandem Computers, and Sybase. Not surprisingly, she has been recognized and has received the most prestigious IEEE Computer Entrepreneur Award. She has been named in the Business Week's most important people list and has also been named in the Fortune 50 most powerful women list. To top all of this, Diane was a competitive sailor and windsurfer for 30 years, and she is the US national champion for Women's National Sailing Championship in 1976. She's still an active uh, member in that sport. True to all technologies of our times, Diane has roots in the East Coast. She got her degree in naval, uh, naval engineering from MIT, mechanical engineering from University of Vermont, and a degree in computer science from University of California, Berkeley. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Diane. So, so it was you know, 14 years ago, um, I co-founded as CEO of this uh, company called VMware. And what we were doing was, uh, we thought we had a better way to compute. We, we basically thought we could put a layer uh, in between the hardware and the operating system uh, that, that would give you a lot more efficiency, better security, better compatibility with different operating system applications, and uh, better just all around resource management. Um, but by doing this, um, it, was, it was somewhat disruptive because well, one, we, we were sitting on top of the Intel and AMD chips, which uh, there's a famous Andy Grove saying, he who gets commoditized last wins. And we were doing, a, you know, it was a little bit of a, you know, we kind of um, controlled what features from those chips would be exposed to some extent. Um, and then, of course, we sat underneath the Microsoft operating system, which was, uh, you know, sort of the ubiquitous monopoly at that point on, um, and uh, the operating system became really just a layer to run applications, and we did all the heavy lifting that a normal operating system would do. And then uh, with all the server vendors, one of the, the big killer apps we had was server consolidation, so you could drive the utilization from 20% up to about 80, 85% which meant you didn't need to buy as many servers. So uh, we had a lot of companies to, you know, that um, were not, you know, I think when you do disruptive innovation, you're doing something new or you're doing something in a much better way, but you're also displacing uh, the old ways of doing things, which can, can make it challenging. Uh, we had a pretty bold aspiration that we actually wrote. We had a vision and mission statement the, the five founders wrote in our first few weeks, so we were all on the same page, uh, something I insisted on because of previous experience in two other startups where 
um, I thought that would have been a good thing to have done. And uh, in that, we said, well, uh, our virtual, it, we, it was a virtualization layer. It would be ubiquitous by the year uh, 2000. Well, <laughs> we founded our company in 1998. Um, I think it's really good to have these high aspirations um, because then you go for it. It was, you know, another, at least another four to six years before the virtualization after 2000. So it took us you know, four to six years longer, but we, but we did become ubiquitous. And I think when you have a vision of something that you actually can see, it's, it is just unequivocally a better way to do something. And you also can see how to do it. You know that it's possible. It's just a matter of execution and, and, and explaining to the world why this is so valuable. Then uh, that bold aspiration is not so difficult. Um, I, you know, people often ask me, was I surprised by VMware? I was never surprised that we became ubiquitous. I just, it was so obvious this was a better way to do things. Um, I don't think I really expected to build the multi-billion dollar business and even larger um, virtualization industry, you know, to kind of start that industry. That maybe came as a surprise. It wasn't something that we put in our aspirations, but the ubiquity, uh, and, and I just, it, it was helpful to us as a company. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the three main things um, at VMware where I thought were kind of responsible for our success. Not so much in terms of like an operating manual, but more as an approach to how you do things, how you think from first principles, and, and just use experience only where it's applicable. We founded VMware during the dot-com bubble which um, perhaps has some similarities to what's going on in social media now. Uh, when, you know, here we were, we were system infrastructure software, and it just was not sexy compared to sock puppets at pet.com or <laughs> grocery delivery at Webvan. I mean, they were really hot, and, and people were making a ton of money in those companies. And so, um, you know, we, I remember trying to hire, we, we named ourselves VMware for virtual machine software and I was trying to get a PR firm and nobody was returning my calls. So finally I used a connection to call the head of the PR firm and, and she explained to me that they all had sat around and laughed at what kind of company would call themselves VMware, what a stoop, you know, they weren't about to represent us. And, <laughs> And then we thought we would launch the company at something called Demo, and, and our advisors said, oh, you need to hire a marketing person to tell you how to get into Demo, and we did, and the, the person came in and she said, well, you know, don't even think you're gonna get on stage, because only the really hot companies get on stage, but maybe you'll get one of those little tables. And um, so we, we actually said, no thanks, we didn't want our help, and we did it on our own, and we got on stage. We didn't get the maximal time slot, but we did get a standing ovation when we booted Windows on Linux after, uh, um, we showed Windows running on Linux after one Windows blue screened. People were pretty <laughs> excited to see Windows keep running at that time. Um, but anyhow, so, so, so the first really important area, probably the most important area, is the people and hiring. And there, I think, uh, you really have to be very creative. Uh, because we were not sexy, because we were this deep technology, it was really hard to get people to believe in what we were doing, and we would try and get these very experienced people and for example, I remember trying to hire someone to run QA. It was incredibly important. Here we were supporting all the software on us. Eventually, we knew we were going to the servers, so there was a phenomenal amount of testing required. And we found this great QA guy, and we just really couldn't convince him to join the company. And meanwhile, uh, I had this Swedish nanny, and she had this Swedish boyfriend who came over to do some yard work for us. And I was just blown away by how systematic this guy was, how hardworking he was. And I asked him, you know, and he said he, he was manning a phone for some chip company as a customer support person. I said, well, would you come in and do some testing on the weekends for us? And he said, sure. 
Well, this guy went on to run all of QA at VMware, and, and he left VMware recently, and he's now, there's a startup, networking startup pretty far along called Nasira, Nasira um, and he's running all of QA for them. So, uh, you know, he didn't have any preconceived notions that we were doing something stupid, and, uh, you know, he, 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 was, he, he had what we needed. So, I mean, it doesn't, you're not always that lucky, but... Uh, when we went to raise our seed fa um, fund, uh, you know, I had been out talking to people and a lot of people didn't really, they said, well, this is really hard technology and you guys are really good, but good luck finding a market. And so we finally, we went to people that we knew um, that were deep technologists that happened to have money. So we got um, Andy Bechtelsheim and David Cheriton and John Hennessy. Well, we didn't even have to explain at all, you know, why this would be valuable, because they just knew it, and that's how we raised our seed funds. Fund. So I think it's, it's really important when you're raising money to kind of find a match, if you can, um, in terms of in-depth understanding of, of what you're doing, particularly if it is uh, deep technology. Um, when I went to get a board, I was like, well, okay, we don't have VCs, how am I gonna get a board? So I called a top headhunting firm and to gave him some names of the people we wanted, I would like to bring onto the board, and he said, there's no way. Well, so one of the names was Larry Sonsini, who was at that time uh, running Wilson Sonsini, which was really the top tech law firm um, out in Silicon Valley. And uh, so I got an appointment with him and just went in to see him and explained how we sat between Microsoft and Intel and I really needed someone like him that, that had seen all these deals and knew, knew how these people were gonna try and manipulate us as a little company. And he said, well, I'm pretty busy getting off boards, but I'll think about it. And that was a Friday afternoon. He joined the board that Monday and it went from there. So. So I think, you know, it's a question of knowing what you want and, what, and having very good reasons for it, and you can generally find a way there. Um, on the business side, it was really hard because of the bubble. Um, and, and, and in sales, it was just a, a process of continual up, upgrade. Uh, I, I really couldn't attract the kind of salespeople I wanted, and so, you know, Basically what would happen is these people would come in and they'd start helping us sell the product uh, and and then they it happened every time where I'd go, okay, so what do you think we're gonna be able to do? And they would give you know, the the first guy was like, you know, you Diane, you're just too ambitious. This this is like a fifteen to twenty five million dollar a year company. You should be really proud of it. It's great. So I was like, okay, trying to get a new salesperson. And, and, and that happened three or four times before we finally uh, got our last one who's still with the company and actually now the president of the company. But uh, that was over a period of five years. Um, I think we had four different people running sales because we had to keep showing the momentum to attract uh, better salespeople. Um, and and to that point, how we went to market was, was, a, was a very uh, key decision. And we made a decision early on to, you know, when you don't have any revenue, you don't need much revenue to show 100% growth. And so we, um, we didn't feel like we, we knew about, we wanted ultimately to be in the server, enterprise server market, but we, we said, let's start on the desktop and, and, and that was a product we sold $99 for hobbyists, $300 for, for uh, uh, companies. And what that would do would be to let us have something that was easy to sell over the internet and didn't require a sales force, and it would prove the technology and give us credibility. And there were all those Linux users out there that needed a way to run Microsoft with Windows, so it was kind of a killer app as well. And, and that worked incredibly well. I mean, we did get that business up to about 100 million a year eventually, but, um, but we were working on the server right from the beginning. And it's interesting, I do a 
classes at some of the business schools, and uh, one of them I do with John Morgridge, who was the CEO of Cisco, and one, he always gives me grief. Why did you start on the desktop? You should have started on the server. That was the big market. Um, and I think he's trying to provoke the students, but, but, but it's, I don't think it's necessarily right to go after your ultimate market initially. It's good to kind of Trojan horse in in something that's a little easier to bring to market as long as it has synergies uh, with where you're going. Um, and then the focus thing, uh, you know, we, we were having trouble getting our, you know, our revenues were growing, we were sort of cash neutral, uh, we were keeping a sort of a six month runway of our money, and we had all these German banks come in and say, you know, we would really like it if you would support OS2. And they were willing to give us a lot of money to support OS2, but OS2 was technically incredibly challenging, much harder than, than Linux or Windows or any of the other, um, you know, the common operating systems. So there was this huge opportunity cost, and, and that was a real um, introspective moment for us. And we just finally said, look, we got to bet on our future. And everybody knows OS2 is a dying operating system. And so we, we said no and, and, and just didn't take the money. Um, and, it, it, you know, in tw and then 64-bit, when we got into the server, same thing, Intel was willing to give us a lot of money to support, um, oh, I forget the name of it, but, there, you know, it, it eventually died out, um, their new architecture. Um, not 64-bit, but, oh, shoot, I forget the name. But anyhow, we didn't do that, and, and that's now dead as well. So always making our decisions to bet on the future proved uh, really valuable. Um, to get into the enterprise, we knew we, we, we needed, you know, we were going to run all the software running on a server was going to sit on top of us. We needed credibility and you couldn't sell that product over the internet, so we needed a big sales force, so we needed leverage. And, and we, we actually knew that from day one and started talking to the hardware vendors at the time, Compaq, Dell, HP, and, and IBM. And IBM, of course, had done virtualization in the 60s on the mainframe, but it had died out. But at least they had a context for the value of virtualization. And, um, but we were trying to get these guys, you know, we were saying, look, we got, the, we, by that time we sort of had an early server product out and we said, we really want to partner with you. We think this will be good for your customers. And uh, we just couldn't get any of them to sign. We we're a little further along with IBM because of some of the uh, technologists there that understood it. We weren't making great progress with the marketing people. Um, and so we invented this thing, the preferred hardware vendor program, and we said, look, we're going to close this program on this date, and we need a name of, of uh, someone in your organization to work with us, and we're going to do this press release, and I think you want to be in it. I don't think you want to be the only hardware vendor that's not in it, and um, are you in or out? And, and um, you know, then we held our breath, and, and everybody joined, and we were able to, to announce the VMware Preferred Hardware Vendor Program with all these hardware vendors. Um, and now we had someone assigned to us at these organizations to work with us. And, uh, and what this did was, oh, the other thing they had to do was say that if they, a customer ran our software on their platform, that they would support it. That was very, very key for us. So we could go to a customer and say, don't worry, you know, IBM's got, gonna support it or HP's gonna support it, it's not just us. And we had to, of course, be the real people supporting it. And, uh, and then we got an incredible, so then we start working on go-to-market deals and, and I, I would say the break we got that really cracked open the enterprise market was, was with IBM. Now, what IBM did was uh, we were going to resell with IBM. So they had, the reason they were the furthest along is they had these big Intel servers and nobody really was buying them because uh, the operating system didn't scale up to use them all and, and you couldn't run a big application on them. And so by putting VMware on their machines, they could all, all of a sudden sell them and they were very high margin machines. So IBM finally 
was going to resell us. We were the first software company the hardware division had ever resold with. We were incredibly excited about this, you know, all hands on deck, so, you know, pushing this and doing everything we could for it. And uh, the IBM lawyers discovered that we bundled some GPL code with our distribution. It's a Linux code, um, GNU public license, and uh, which has really never been tested in court. And they felt like there was a contamination issue potentially. And they nixed the deal. It was kind of a dark day. And, uh, and then we had this idea. We went to them. We said, well, what about if your partners resold us? instead of you, and the lawyer said, yeah, that would work. <clears throat> and um, so what happened next was IBM had this global partner network, and their elite partners were called their exact partners, and they were you know, all over the world just incredibly sophisticated with lots of sales engineers, very technical sales engineers. And uh, they, t they invited us to their global partnering conference. They let us give the keynote. They let us train people um, and, and give them literature and the whole shebang, and, and that's really what let us uh, break into the server market. So I think the moral of that story is you get lucky, but you have to be ready. You know, you kind of have to create your luck, and you have to be ready to pounce on it, and, uh, you know, and it doesn't always happen, but if it does, um, you want to be there to, to, to take advantage of it. Uh, building VMware, uh, you know, was an intense experience, but I, the other thing I want to comment on is uh, the importance of also maintaining your life and having an outside life. Well, at least for me, it was important. It's it, not necessarily, but uh, I had my second kid six months after we founded the company, and uh, the other founders all got married and had kids in the first five years of the company. And uh, the, the one company we were always competing with for people, and we always felt like they generally won, they didn't win all the time, was Google, because uh, we started about the same time. And uh, when I recently joined the board of Google, um, Larry and Sergey were explaining one of the reasons I was there was um, they said there was one company when we were building Google that we would lose to for, for the best engineers, and that was VMware. And, I think the places where we won those battles for these great engineers was when people wanted an outside life. Not everybody did, some wanted, and I think Google was much more, you know, mature, um, you know, more possibility now. But anyhow, what we did was we sent people home in the evening because I wanted to go home and be with my kids. And I would leave in the middle of the day if I wanted to go see my kid do something at school and let everybody know about it. So it was just a different attitude. We were incredibly efficient and hardworking. Um, and we were certainly on email late at night, but, um, but, but did manage to raise a family. Uh, VMware was really one of the funnest things I ever did, and uh, you know I just want to say that when, when you know building a disruptive company is just just a great thing to do, and you just got to think from first principles and 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 take advantage of all the experience that's that's out there. Um, so good luck to any of you that are building companies. Thank you.